Settlers by Jay Sakai Chapter 13 Class, Culture, and Community Note This chapter expresses income figures in 1979 or 78 dollars. Convert specific figures to current dollars using this site, or multiply it by roughly 3.2. Beginning of quote. A UE international officer said, in November 1968, to a group of shop stewards and local union officers, quote, For the past two years, as you know, we have been having widespread discussion in our union on the general feeling of rebellion, cynicism, and disgust among young workers. Let's examine now why these young workers coming into the shops today feel and act as they do. When this young guy starts getting his weekly paycheck, it looks pretty good, but not for long. Soon he buys a house with a 30-year mortgage. He puts some furniture in the house. He buys a car, a refrigerator, washer, and dryer. A TV, likely a color TV. On top of all that, his young wife is pregnant again. As the monthly bills start piling up, his pay envelope looks ridiculous. He sees no reason at all why America, the richest country in the world, can't give him a job that will provide him with all of the necessities and some of the luxuries of life. And what's wrong with that? He is frustrated. He is mad. He is ready to fight the establishment that fails to give him what he needs. End quote. By Maddles and Higgins, Them and Us. Beginning of another long quote. I'd like to tell you why we are troubled. First, we are tired of being politically courted and then legally extorted. Second, we are sick and tired of institutions, both public and private, not being responsive. Third, we feel powerless in our dealings with these monoliths. Fourth, we do not like being blamed for all the problems of black America. Fifth, and perhaps the key, we anguish at all of the class prejudice that is forced upon us. End quote. The speaker is Barbara Mikulski, a third-generation Polish-American from Baltimore, and there is little question that she speaks for millions of the inhabitants of what Peter Binzen calls White Town, USA. People forget that in the metropolitan areas, twice as many white as non-white families live in, quote, official poverty. <clears throat> Of course, many white towners don't qualify for that governmental distinction. They are poor, but not poor enough. The white town husband and father works as a truck driver, or turret lathe operator, or policeman, or longshoreman, or white collar clerk. Perhaps at more than one of these jobs, to buy and hold on to his 14 foot wide house and new color television set. Quote, the only place we feel any sense of identity, community, or control is that little home we prize, says Mikulski. But there again, we feel threatened by black people. End of quote from the Carnegie Quarterly, Fall 1970. Euro-American workers are absorbed, as are Boer Afrikaner workers in Azania, into supra-class settler communities where the petty bourgeoisie is leadership and the labor aristocracy is the largest and most characteristic element. There is a distinct and exceptional Euro-American way of life that materially and ideologically fuses together the settler masses shopkeeper, trade unionist, and school teacher alike. 
the general command of bourgeois ideology over these settler communities is reinforced by the mobilization of tens of millions of Euro-Americans into special reactionary organizations. Those Euro-Americans who are miserated or heavily exploited are not only still commanded by loyalty to, quote, their empire, but are submerged and disconnected amongst the far larger, heavily privileged mass of their fellow citizens. These, quote, white poor, are truly the lost, the abandoned remnants of the old class struggle, existing without direction inside Babylon. While there are numbers of Euro-American workers, they no longer combine into a separate proletarian class. The old white industrial proletariat of the 1930s has been dissolved by promotion and privilege, and its place taken by the colonial proletariats. The abnormal and historically brief contradiction of proletarian class conflict within the settler garrison has been ended. Just as in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, the U.S. oppressor nation is again a non-proletarian society that is purely capitalistic in character. The level of decadence and general privilege can be measured by examining the class structure. Revisionist analyses of the U.S. class structure are, of course, deliberately misleading. Most typically, the revisionists lump together the U.S. oppressor nation with the various third world oppressed nations and national minorities as one society. Their scheme is to try and hide Babylon behind the masses of colonial workers. They typically say, quote, America has a working class majority. This implies about settler society what is not true. A more subtle distortion is to focus on Euro-Americans, but to determine, quote, class by sorting each individual man and woman into different occupational groupings, roughly correlating to a private relationship to the means of production and distribution. This approach lets the revisionists claim that the majority of white Americans are working class. This approach denies the, quote, sensuous reality of human society. Classes are huge, self-defined, living social formations, with general aspects and aspects unique to their own history, time, and nation. Engels, in this regards, notes, quote, The working classes have always, according to the different states of the development of society, lived in different circumstances and had different relations to the owning and ruling classes, end quote. It is our task to discover and explore the tangible class formations that have their own existence in material life, completely independent of our investigation. The revisionist distortion, on the contrary, seeks to arbitrarily concoct statistical categories, fill them up, on paper anyway, with abstract individuals and call this classes. This is just bourgeois sociology with, quote, left rhetoric. The U.S. oppressor nation is a patriarchal settler society of some complexity. In general, Euro-Americans exist in family units, with the class identity of the family primarily dependent on the husband or father. We should say that we neither advocate this situation nor see it as eternal. It is the prevailing reality at this time, in this century, and it is our task to understand it. The revisionist methodology comes up with conclusions like, quote, 
all secretaries are in the clerical sector of the working class. That sounds reasonable to many. Factually, however, it isn't true. For example, if a young Euro-American woman works as a secretary, came from a petty bourgeois family background, is married to a professional, lives in an exclusive white residential suburb or, quote, arty urban community, shares in a family income of $30,000 per year, is she working class? Could she be working class but her husband and children are petty bourgeois? Obviously, such a person would, in the actual social world that exists, be solidly flourishing within the petty bourgeoisie. This is not such a far-fetched example. Fully 25% of Euro-American women employed as clerical sales personnel are married to men who are managers or professionals. 17% of the wage-employed wives of male managers, includes small retail businesses, are blue-collar workers. Due to the patriarchal nature of Euro-American society, most women from the middle classes are forced, when seeking employment, to accept non-professional, clerical, and retail sales jobs. This does not necessarily change their class identity. One study shows that roughly one-third of all secretaries under 30 years of age are graduates of colleges or junior colleges. This is commonplace knowledge. We have to describe classes as they exist, not define them as concocted categories of our own making. We can gain a better idea of this patriarchal settler society's class structure by looking at Euro-American male occupations alone. While this is nowhere near as accurate as conducting social investigation, actually going out and surveying the masses in all aspects of their lives, it should help us see the general outlines of the class situation. Footnote. Mao Zedong, for example, in his social investigation of China's countryside, found significance not just in economic roles, but in concomitant social changes. Quote, As to the authority of the husband, it has always been comparatively weak among poor peasants, because the poor peasant women, for financial reasons, compelled to engage more in manual work than women in the wealthier classes, have obtained greater rights to speak and more power to make decisions in family affairs. They also enjoy considerable sexual freedom. Among the poor peasants, triangular and multilateral relationships are most universal. End footnote. This outline is not a full class analysis, we must caution. For our purposes here, we do not need to separately delineate the big bourgeoisie, regional, and local bourgeoisie, and the varied middle classes, small business proprietors, salaried managers, landowning farmers, professionals, etc. All these are placed into one bourgeois-petty-bourgeois grouping, which contains what are separate classes. This is based on the 1970 census. Bourgeois and middle classes, 37%. Managers, 12 of this. Managers, 12%. Professionals, 15%. Salesmen, agents, and brokers, 5%. Farm owners and managers, 3%. Clerical administrative, 1.15%. Another top heading. Core of labor aristocracy, 24%. In that, craftsmen, 22%. Protective security, such as police, firemen, etc., 
2%. Another top level, workers, includes much of labor aristocracy, 39%. Of this, factory and transport machine operators, 18%. Laborers, 7%. Clerical, 6%. Retail sales clerks, 2%. General service, 5%. Footnote. The actual U.S. bourgeoisie is abnormally large. The wealthiest 1% of the U.S.'s empire's population, one out of every 100 adults of all nationalities, primarily Euro-American, own an average of $1.32 million each. This is the zone where the upper petty bourgeois and local bourgeoisie meet. Earlier studies indicate that the actual big bourgeoisie, DuPonts, Rockefellers, Morgans, is only a fraction of this number, perhaps as few as 15,000 individuals. End of footnote. This breakdown of Euro-American male occupations has a very clear meaning, verifying everything about white America that daily life has told us. The bourgeois, the middle classes, and the core of labor aristocracy are the absolute majority, over 60%. The labor aristocracy is swollen in size. Almost two out of every hundred male Euro-Americans are policemen, firemen, or other protective security workers. Highly paid construction tradesmen, machinists, mechanics, and other skilled craftsmen outnumber ordinary production and transportation workers. Even this greatly understates the extent of settler labor aristocracy. Many Euro-American factory workers, technicians, clerical workers, and even general laborers, such as municipal park department, quote, laborers in the major cities, receive extra proletarian wages, sometimes doing light labor and usually no toil at all. The settler labor aristocracy is considerably larger than its hard core, perhaps comprising as much as 50% of all male Euro-Americans. End of introduction.